Hi, my name is Michael Dash. I am the president and CEO of Parallel HR Solutions, and I am joining Derek today to talk about my entrepreneurial journey and new book coming out called Chasing the High. Welcome to the Business Leadership Series, where we engage with leaders who are making an impact on their worlds and who want to share their knowledge and experience for your personal and professional growth. The following interview is designed to inspire you to become the best leader you can be. Your host, Derek Champagne, is the founder and CEO of The Artist Evolution, a full-service agency building successful brands, marketing tools, and campaigns, and also the author of the best-selling book, Don't Buy a Duck. And now, let's begin today's Leadership Series interview. Welcome to the Business Leadership Series, where our goal is to inspire you to become the best leader that you can be. I'm excited about our guest today. He is Michael Dash. He's the founder and CEO of Parallel HR. He's an investor, a speaker, and the author of the upcoming book, Chasing the High, The Entrepreneur Addiction. Michael, thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me, Derek. You've got a a really interesting story, and that's one reason why I wanted to talk with you today. You're a seasoned entrepreneur, like several of our listeners. You've been through the trenches. You've experienced some crazy roller coaster rides of entrepreneurship, making millions, losing millions, and then even battling with addiction in the process. So we want to learn from you today. You share your message that helps entrepreneurs who are working to build their empires uh, and seven-figure businesses. Can you start kind of early on? Tell us a little bit about who you are and kind of what got you to where you are today. Sure. I grew up in New Jersey. Um, the East Coast. I'm currently in Salt Lake City, Utah, um, so I do preface that. And um, I grew up in a uh, family where my father was actually an entrepreneur himself. We were a middle-class family, um, and he owned an import-export business and retail operation that was focused on fine china and crystals and collectibles. So Yadro, Lalique, Baccarat, Hummels, if any of your audience is familiar with that, And, um, you know, I would never be familiar with any of that unless I grew up with it. (laughs) So if if they're not, I certainly understand. Um, So, you know, I kind of learned early on what hard work was all about because my father worked all the time. He was rarely around to come to sporting events. That was always my mother. Um, and, And he was always at the office or at the store. And he had me in there from the age of 10 helping him, you know, set up displays, work in the warehouse, do do whatever was was needed. So I learned early on, like I was mentioning before, you know, what hard work really was. And he really instilled that work ethic in me. Uh, so that's kind of the childhood that I that I grew up in. It's just kind of what I knew. Yeah, that's interesting. You know, as as a, as a father myself and, and an entrepreneur, I, I, I'm always watching. And we'll talk about this a little later on about balance and what you've learned about balance. But keep 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 taking me through your journey. So you, you learned about hard work. You you saw your dad working all the time. You were part of the business, so to speak, as as far as him putting you to work. What are some other highlights in your life early on? Yeah, so I was the kid who got the job before everybody else. I was a little bit, a couple months older than most of the people in my class. So I went out and I got a job, you know, at the Travel Mart on the Garden State Parkway where I got to wear an amazingly good looking visor and have my, all my friends come in and make fun of me uh, while I was hauling donuts out from, uh, you know, the truckers that didn't want it on their stops. Um, but you know, I, th- those are some good, fun memories actually, because th- it's actually completely true. Like, uh, uh, high school friends would come up there and make fun of me. Um, but, um, but I was comfortable in my skin, so I was fine with it. And, uh, so I started working there. I had jobs all through high school. Then I went to the university of Maryland I wanted to kind of go. I grew up in a very small town. There were 89 in my graduating class. Our high school had 500 people, and it was seven through 12 uh, grades. So it it was small, 10,000 people in the the town. So I wanted to go to a bigger school, uh, something that I wasn't exposed to. So I went to the University of Maryland, uh, which was uh, I had a great time there. When I went there, I was studying marketing. Uh, I got a job like right away. Uh, selling home improvements. So I was going door to door in Baltimore and D.C. and some of the toughest neighborhoods in the country, 
uh, knocking on doors, selling roofing, siding, decks, and windows. And I learned a lot there. Um, you know, I tell everybody, if, if you really want to learn how to sell, go door to door. You know, that that's the hardest uh, sale there is. And, you know, after I was successful doing that, you know, I felt equipped to be able to sell anything to anyone at any time. And uh, and, and then I, so I graduated uh, college in my four years and then uh, I was a big sports nut. So I transitioned into a job that was selling sports, was selling advertisements in sports publications for 500 colleges across the country. Hmm. Um, and, you know, I prefaced that and I mentioned saying I was a sports nut because I had a major gambling addiction, hmm. uh, which, which kind of started at 10 years old um, with, with my uncle introducing it to me at, at one Thanksgiving. So, you know, like being so crazed into sports and everything, I thought, hey, getting it and, and, and like I was gambling all the time, every single day. I was like, oh, this would be amazing. I get to go and sell advertising in these game day football and basketball publications of the schools I'm like betting on. Like, this is awesome. Right. And I just saw like, you know, I just thought it was amazing. So so I did that. And it was really just on the phone sales, pounding the phones for 12 hours a day. Well, I did. I was doing that for two years out in Elmont, uh, Long Island, New York, near the Belmont racetrack. Yeah. Another another bad thing for a gambler. <laughs> I know. Uh, I, I, my wife's from Long Island. I know that. I know that casino racetrack over there. Oh, there you go. There you go. <laughs> so you know, it probably wasn't the best environment <laughs> no. to be close to. Um, but uh, so after two years there, I got promoted to open up a new office in New York City uh, with one of the other guys. So then I transitioned into New York City. We opened up an office there. Over time, though, I, I really wasn't feeling good about what I was doing. Um, I was very successful. I was making more money than my friends out of college. But I just did not feel good about squeezing small business owners and contractors. So take me to the next step. So you, you talk about you talk about making millions, losing millions, the addiction, the, how, how the, the addictions played their role in all of that. Take, take me to that part of it. When did you – what was your next step and how did you start making that other money? Yeah, so I'll take you to the next step, and then I'll rewind and take you on the little gambling uh, addiction that that started for me. Um, so the, the the next step after that is uh, so basically my my best friend that I grew up with, we known each other since three years old, was in the staffing industry, and you know had kind of said to me, "Hey, I think you would be awesome in this industry, and that together we would just crush things. You know, you should come join my company." At the time, he was the president. And the owner of the company was from our town that we all grew up in. Huh. So I said, you know what? That sounds like a, I didn't really have anything going on. I didn't know what I was going to do. I knew I would sell something because I could sell. But I just didn't know what. When he mentioned that, I said, that's a good idea. But I want to get a job at a different company for the first year so I can learn the industry on their dime. And then I'll come and I'll join you. Hmm. And that's exactly what I did. So I went and uh, got a job at a company called Hall Kenyon which was a technology staffing company. They were eventually bought out by K-Force, which is uh, one, of the, one of the big ones in, uh, in the country. And uh, I worked there for a year uh, selling technology staffing services. And at the time, I had met my ex-business partner there, which I didn't, I didn't know she would be my ex-business partner, but I met her there. Um, uh, we worked together pretty well. I was good in sales. She was very uh, tech-savvy. And we closed a lot of deals together. And then 9-11 happened. So she went back to Utah, where she was originally from. And I obviously stayed in New York. And then I went and transitioned to work for, for my buddy. And um, so I did that for, uh, for four years. And while I was working for him, I was calling on E-Trade Financial. And uh, they said to me, hey, Michael, we don't have any business in New York, New Jersey. But if you happen to know somebody in Sandy, Utah... We're trying to hire 200 financial service reps here in the next three and a half weeks. And I was just like, what? Of yeah. all the places like they could have mentioned, they mentioned Utah. I only knew one person in the staffing <laughs> industry outside of the metropolitan area. And that was my ex business partner. And she was in Utah. Huh. So but the company I worked for didn't want the business. They only wanted stuff in the metropolitan area. So, you know, I, the hustler and entrepreneur I, I am, 
I said, well, I'm going to take advantage of this one way or the other. I called her. I said, do you want in on this? I'm going to put a bid together. If not, I'll go find somebody else. And she's like, no, 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 I want in. So we worked on a bid all day Sunday. I remember a clear as day, submitted it at the end of the night. And the next morning at like 11 a.m., the SVP of HR from E-Trade called me and said, hey, Michael, we reviewed your bid. We accept your bid. Let's get going. And at that point, I was like, uh, holy cow. <laughs> um, so I, I took my two-week vacation. I flew out to Utah. We put a team together. And we ended up filling all 200 positions within three and a half weeks wow. under budget or on budget. And from that, we got projects in Alpharetta, Georgia, Jersey City, and Tampa, Florida. And in one year, filled 800 full-time financial service rep positions for wow. E-Train um, in one year. Now, I still had my full-time job. So I was doing this on the side, you know, taking a cut of it. And then we had, the, you know, my ex-business partner and, and her team who were filling all these jobs. So it was a quite an interesting time. And, uh, you know, I still that was the best financial year of, of my life. I still haven't you know, made, made them have that good a financial year since then. So so that kind of after all that happened, you know, my uh, my uh, good friend actually got in a dispute with the owner of the company, which ended up in court. It was over a house he was selling to the owner's daughter, believe it or not. Nothing to do with the business. Mm -hmm. And um, they ended up parting ways. So at that point, I had uh, six months to, to kill, and I decided I'd come out to Utah, help my ex-business partner get Parallel HR started with the intent of going back to New York. But um, once I came out here, landed a big client right away, Overstock.com. We started doing really well with them, and it came to a point where she was offering me 50% to stay, and my buddy was offering me 30%, and I was a very money-driven person. All my decisions were based on money, and for that reason, I elected to go to Utah and uh, you know, start Parallel HR with her, and that's what um, landed me here 10 years ago. Wow. You talk about chasing the high, battling addiction you were chasing highs as an addict and entrepreneur and how it relates to all entrepreneurs. Take, take me there. Take me to where you started having some challenges, uh, where, where it was starting to seep into your, to, uh, a more, uh, more consequences for you. Yeah. So, you know, I, I was exposed to gambling when I was 10 years old by my uncle and, uh, you know, whether he knew better or not, uh, I just don't know, but he handed me the sheet of uh, paper and he said, Hey, if you saw, if you circle four games on here and get them right, and you go get $10 from your parents and give it to me, then you'll win $100. Hmm. And I was like, oh, my God, that is so cool. So I ran over to my dad, and he said no. And then I ran to my mom, and she gave me the money. And I told her it was for, you know, we're going to get hoagies. That's what they call them in Massachusetts, yes. hoagies. <laughs> uh, so, um, so I got the $10, and then, and you know, me and my brother circled the games, and uh, we won. So we won all four games. So that was a big mistake. That was a big problem. So, you know, I was addicted right there. I mean, I felt this rush. I was so excited. And that started me into gambling. And I, then I started gambling with my father's coworkers when I would work for him in the warehouse. All the warehouse guys gambled. My little league coach gambled. He would take me down to the Meadowlands racetrack and we would be gambling. And I was like 13, 14, 15 years old. Then that progressed to my friends playing card games every single weekend. And I'm, br I'm the first one who has a job and a bank account, and I'm bringing my checkbook to a card game. Hmm. They don't even have bank accounts. <laughs> they don't even have. And so, you know, it was just I, I, was, I was addicted, you know. And then it got worse in college, and then I started becoming a bookie myself. I was taking bets and then making bets and then – you know, with any addiction, cross addiction is very familiar. It's very easy to fall into these things. Mm -hmm. And I did. And, you know, I got involved with some drugs and, you know, I was doing, uh, you know, because gambling wasn't uh, high enough for me. Right. I needed, an, I needed something hot, get me higher. Yeah. And th that's where drugs came in. And so I was mixing them. And, um, and then it continued after college and it continued into my work life. Now, one thing I was always able to do is, is kind of separate the drugs and the, the gambling or not separate. I guess the drugs separate. I would only do stuff on the weekends and, th and stuff. But the gambling I was doing every day. So I was working 
And then I'd be playing party poker in my office and the boss would be walking by me and I'd be minimizing the screen. Hmm. Right? right. And then I'd be making up that I'm going to meetings, but I'm really going across town to meet my bookie to pay him off all the money I lost that week. And then I have to come back and cover that with another lie. So it started to become a, a, a major problem. And then, um, and then I decided that I kind of needed some help. And, you know, that's, that's kind of when, uh, when I went to, uh, to GA and I went to GA not having any thoughts of giving up gambling, but just, I wanted to check it out and see what it was all about. Mm -hmm. And actually ever since I walked in there through some tough love and a lot of work, I haven't gambled since. And that was 12 years ago, um, mm -hmm. from there. But it has it has consequences because now all of a sudden you stop gambling or you stop any addiction and now you have time and a lot of time. Right. And what are you going to do with that time? Right. So that's where like really chasing the high is really all about because I just gave up this major high. And like, yes, I, I, I get some sort of high from closing a deal right from a sales standpoint. Right. But it kind of wasn't really the same. Um, so I thought, let me do something positive, And I started running. And uh, I ran four marathons in five years. Hmm. And, and I was addicted to that high. Right. Like I really would get this runner's high. Right. And it would kind of replace that gambling high. But at the same time, it was so I was doing it so much to the extreme that my life was completely unbalanced and unfulfilled. So I would just work and run. I went from working and gambling to working and running. Hmm. Yeah, that, I, I can relate to that story in some ways. I, I was actually today talking to a health coach that I'm working with, a, a, not a trainer, but a health coach. And, and uh, I said, you know, I'm an all or nothing kind of guy. You know, it's all business, all something. So uh, I said, if, if we do this the wrong way, I will just try to do nothing but run marathons and exercise all the time. I'm just looking for a life hack that helps me integrate this in a healthy way and doesn't take over. So it's like I'm not going to become a vegan tomorrow. I'm not doing some of these things. So help me do this in moderation. You you talk about and chasing the high, and I want to get into your book here in just a second. Uh, but you you talk about as an addict and entrepreneur and how it relates to all entrepreneurs. What is a connection? I mean, how do you make a connection to other entrepreneurs uh, with your story? So I, I think in a variety of ways, um, because I, you know, after the, the, the running and everything, I ended up having two back surgeries. So um, I then kind of uh, transitioned into like doing a massive amount of fundraising. And, you know, I was working uh, with Leukemia and Lymphoma Society, who I still work with today and you know about uh, over a year ago was nominated for their man of the year uh man woman of the year um, competition yeah. which is a 10-week fundraising blitz so in 10 weeks i put together a team and we were able to raise seventy five thousand dollars in 10 weeks right. which which was pretty awesome yeah. but again again it was i was chasing something like when i was doing that every time like a donation came in i would get like a high from it Right. It was like, yes, yes. Like a sale. Right. It was like a high. Right. But then it wasn't good enough. Like I just needed another one and another one and another one. Just like I, in my gambling, I would gamble on a game. It wasn't good enough. I needed to then go gamble at halftime of that game. Right. right. Um, and so on and so forth. And it's kind of similar in business. Like I was growing parallel HR with my team and I, it wasn't, you know, I wanted it bigger. And so I tried expanding. And so I opened an office in New York and then we had an office in India and then I was trying to manage it all. And it was just like, it was just way too much. I was kind of running in like almost a manic state. I was running my business like from a manic standpoint because that's all I knew. So it was just like I was chasing a more sale, another sale, another sale, another sale, another location, another, you know, whatever it was, more money, more revenue. I need more and more and more. And, you know, and then we were incorporating like new service lines and it was just like nothing in moderation. It was like extreme all the time. And, you know, I know a lot of entrepreneurs because I'm in a whole bunch of entrepreneur organizations, which have been very helpful, actually, to collaborate with other entrepreneurs and stuff uh, who can relate to you. Um, but I know a lot of these people who are just focused on grow, 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 grow. And they're not like 
enjoying number one enjoying it most of the time because they're so just heads down buried and spending 12 14 hour days at work to me that's completely that is not sustainable and it's not it won't last and if it does it's going to make you miserable at some point it's going to either make your home life miserable your family, you're going to neglect, you're going to neglect yourself personally, because, you know, you were just talking about you're with a, a, a health coach, um, did you say? Yes. Yeah. And, you know, if, if you're not like taking care of your body and loving yourself, then you can't be there for others, whether it's your family, whether it's your employees, you can't be there to the best of your ability. And it took me a long time to to listen to that because honestly I thought it was a bunch of BS. I'm like, yeah, I love myself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. You know, right. you know, you, you hear all that stuff. It was like all she, she stuff to me that like, no, I'm from the East coast. I mean, you don't need to tell me to love myself. <laughs> I, 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 you know, I'll tell, I know who I need to love. T- t- tell me more about this chasing the high, the entrepreneur addiction. Let's talk about the book itself. What, what can readers expect to have happen or what can they expect to take out of this book? Yeah, so the book is a journey of of my entrepreneurial journey and the lessons learned along the way. And the reason I wanted to write it is because I am not the type I'm not the person who could tell you how to do everything the right way, but I am the person who can tell you how not to do everything right. the wrong the wrong way. And I made a lot of mistakes along the way, a lot of things like emotional decision making and the effects that uh, those decisions have had on my life. Yeah. I've been yeah. in a five and a half year lawsuit with my ex business partner. And, you know, part of that is making decisions from an emotional state and not being able to have the tools to, to be able to step back, you know, screw my head on right and, and make a, a decision from a kind of a point of view where you're calm, relaxed and and thinking straight. And, you know, by being able to kind of incorporate some things like like meditation, like 15 minutes of meditation a day goes a long way, like consistently going to the gym or whatever it is you might do, whether it's yoga or whether it's, you know, running or CrossFit or whatever, but being consistent with it and not overdoing it. Right. And having that kind of outlet by listening to positive podcasts. Like I never listened to a podcast in my life before last year Hmm. ever, which is kind of crazy. And I didn't believe in a lot of these things, but like uh, affirmations, for instance, can be very helpful in the morning. Just, you know, repeating some affirmations, positive affirmations, getting you in the right frame of mind. Those are all things that have really helped me. And I discuss these things in the book. Uh, along with the challenges I've had and the mistakes that I've made and kind of what I do differently now and how it helps me. So that's kind of the journey uh, that I take everybody on in this book. Yeah, I love that. I look forward to reading it. That, that's great advice. In, in my book, I have a chapter that talks about emotional versus strategic decisions. And it's more about a marketing mindset, this book. But we talk about Maslow's hierarchy of need and how at the bottom, those survival the survival approach is is uh, when you're making decisions out of uh, out of emotions and out of uh, more like the cavemen did, and that doesn't really serve us well. But when you're operating from the top of the triangle, that's when you're operating out of abundance and love and gratitude, and you just make different decisions there. And with our own business, when we're having strategy meetings, I say, you know, I don't I want to have a scarcity mindset. When we make decisions, we're going to make them uh, out of an out of a, a abundance mindset and out of a strategic mindset so that we're making sure we're making them for the right reasons. I love that. I love the personal way that you're sharing this. Any other advice that, that of, of things that you learned or, or things in the book uh, that the readers are going to take away? Well, one thing that really changed my perspective on everything was a trip I took to Bali uh, with a group I became a part of called Unconventional Life. It's a business accelerator, and they had two people there talking about living in flow and the study of flow mastery and what that all means. And again, you know, I had a really, really negative attitude about everything, and it started 
you know, with the uh, the addiction stuff that I, I was still dealing with, but more the lawsuit was driving me crazy. I, I allowed it to take over my entire existence. Mm. And I was vengeful about the whole thing. And I was fighting with my lawyers. And I mean, five and a half years is a long time. I've had friends married and divorced in shorter period of time. <laughs> and I've been in this lawsuit. Um, so I went to Bali. I was in a negative mindset. I, I thought things like flow and astrology and energy were complete BS. I thought it was a scam. I thought it was a way for people to like, you know, take, get, get your money. Right. But when I, I sat and listened to these people about living in flow and they were preaching about, you know, always following your highest intuition and making decisions from the heart versus always from the head. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if it's not a hell yes, then it should be an F no in everything that you do in life. And it was just, it kind of opened my eyes to some things. And I was just like, wow, that sounds like such a lighter way to walk around every day. Such a lighter way to live. Like that doesn't sound that bad. Right. So I, I, I took the course that they offered afterwards and I spent like the thousand dollars or whatever it was. Now in the past, I never would have done that. Because to me, I would equate all these decisions based on the value of the of how much I'm paying, right. like a thousand dollars. Like you got to be kidding me. Even though it's not that much money, but still, you know, I would I would just think it's a ripoff. But I threw caution to the wind, and I allowed because of curiosity more than every anything. And I was just uh, I, I didn't want to keep living in this negative state of mind. I said, let me check this out. And I took the course and we went through this process of clearing out limiting beliefs, like a limiting belief that change is difficult. Like mm -hmm. people think that change is difficult. They think that it's it's like breaded in them. Right. right. Or mm -hmm. inbreded in them, whatever. Right. Um, and, and but it's not really. It's easy. Change is easy because I've done it. Right. And, it, it, you know, it just takes the mind. You, your mind has to be in the right place. So like we cleared out a lot of limiting beliefs, put these positive beliefs in. And, and then like things really started happening in my life that got me to believe in the study practice and living in flow. And it's really allowed me to make decisions from a totally different place. Now I used to get decision fatigue. Like I would go back and forth and back and forth in my mind about almost all these decisions. And, you know, now I, uh, you know, now I do my best to like uh, follow that premise. If it's a hell yes, then I'm in. And if it's not, then I'm out. Yeah. That's great. And don't, and don't agonize it after that. You made your decision and you move on. Yeah. Every decision that I've made, like the last year of my life has been the best year of my life. I am still in a major lawsuit. And I can say it has been the best year of my life because I acted on my intuition and I did so many things for the first time that I had never done in, in the rest of my life that it really gave me fulfillment. Um, you know, you, you were talking about balance before. I really I don't like to use the word balance so much, even though, you know, it's the she she word and everything. It's the word that everyone likes to use now. And I use it some in my book, but it's really about fulfillment to me more than balance. And, you know, it's about having a lot of activities that you're interested in in your life that um, allow you as an entrepreneur to become fulfilled in other areas. So that make you better uh, as a leader and as a leader in the office, as a leader at home and as a leader in the community. And that's what it's done for me. That's great. man. thanks for sharing your story. Your book is coming. When does your book go, come out? So the book will be out in the April, May timeframe, but you can put, uh, if you want to go to my website, uh, you can just fill something out there and we'll provide updates on when the book comes out. And the website is Michael, M-I-C-H-A-E-L, the letter G and dash D-A-S-H. So Michael G dash dot com. And you can just fill out your information. We'll just send you an email when the book comes out. Awesome. Michael G dash dot com. The book is chasing the high, the entrepreneur addiction. Michael, thanks for your, for your candidness and your, and just for how you share your story. I know these things aren't easy. Uh, as entrepreneurs, we a lot of times have a, a certain level of pride 
and uh, and, and want to kind of hold our cards close, so to speak. And so I appreciate you being open about your story and just uh, that I think it's going to help other people. So I'm excited for this book to come out. I'm excited to watch for the next great things that are happening in your life. And again, thanks for sharing your story. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. All right. We'll talk soon. Thanks, Michael. I want to invite you to join me in supporting the American Diabetes Association. I've got the honor of being a Kiss a Pig candidate this year, which is, means I have the opportunity to help raise money for the American Diabetes Association locally. The research, the ADA has been funding innovative research to combat diabetes since 1955. And in 2011, they funded more than $35.75 million a year in research at 139 research institutions across the country. The statistics, approximately 1.25 million American children and adults have type 1 diabetes. As many as one in three American adults will have diabetes in 2050 if present trends continue. I want to invite you to join me in supporting the American Diabetes Association. You can learn more at diabetes.org or stopdiabetes.com to see how you can get involved. You've been listening to the Business Leadership Series, where we engage with leaders who are making an impact on their worlds and who want to share their knowledge and experience for your personal and professional growth. This interview was designed to inspire you to become the best leader you can be. 